so uh, the topic I'll be discussing about is bootleggers and Baptists in urban India. So two and a half years ago, a friend of mine sent me an article. Uh, this article was written in 1983 by a person called Bruce Yandel. He's an economist in the US. So the name of the article was bootleggers and Baptists, an education of a regulatory economist. So this article gives us public policy enthusiasts a tool, an analogy through which we can look at the various players of a modern economy, of any sector in the modern economy. So I wasn't the least bit surprised to find that this analogy was quite useful in understanding why living in urban India, in most parts of urban India is such a huge torture. So let me move on to explain what the analogy is about. So when Yandel wrote that article, uh, many states in the United States had laws prohibiting the sale of alcohol on Sundays. So the politicians in these states passed these laws because they had the support of two groups of people primarily. One were the Baptists. So the Baptists are a group of conservative Christians who observe Sunday as their day of Sabbath. So then they find alcohol to be demonic. So they would support uh, public policy which would ban alcohol on Sundays. So the other group of uh, people who supported such laws prohibiting the sale of alcohol on Sundays were the bootleggers. These were the buggers who smuggled in alcohol and sold it on Sunday at a hefty price. And uh, yes, the politician, he took support not only from the Baptists, but also from the bootleggers. The Baptists, he would take for their support during uh, various public fora or meeting or during campaign. The bootleggers would come in to help them in uh, re-election funding. So, how is this applicable over here in urban India? So, let me first come to the issue of transport, uh, yeah, transportation in our cities. Let me first address taxi industry. So, the photo you are seeing over here is the one taken by Hindustan Times. It is a taxi association in Delhi protesting the entry of Uber and Ola. So, they are wanting a ban on Uber and Ola. So most of you probably would have uh, remembered the media ruckus and the political fireworks which accompanied the entry of these two aggregators into Indian cities. So the bootleggers in this case are these fellows basically. So these are the old taxi associations as the old established taxi companies. They through their efforts in public policy, influencing public policy, sometimes even through violence are wanting to prevent the entry of competitors to the entry of competitors and their competitors from legally competing with them in the market by offering lower prices and better service. So who are the Baptists supporting them? The Baptists supporting them are the wise fellows in the media who are pontificating to us that anything associated with Uber and Ola is quite bad, including pontificating to us about how search pricing is bad or how their model itself is inherently immoral. You must have read one or two articles about it in the news. So those were the Baptists. So the Baptists are virtually sanctifying the actions of these bootleggers and trying to prevent their competitors from legally competing with them. And this alliance of bootleggers, are, uh, bootleggers and Baptists is costing us consumers. We are forced to pay higher taxi fares. We are also forced to pay higher for re, higher, very high prices for reliability of these taxis. In fact, on our average prices, we will uh, we'll be forced to rely less on our taxis. Over here, there is another instance where I found this analogy, be, analogy to be quite useful is explaining a certain situation which happened in Karnataka. So this map of which you see over here is the map of Bangalore. So in 1999, you can see the red part is the area, the urban area, the densely populated urban areas. You can see the red part rapidly spreading as you come to 2014. So this is a paper by three authors from Bangalore. So as you can see, the demand for new townships is increasing, especially towards the edges of Bangalore. So the Karnataka government introduced a relaxation in norms. So originally what existed was some norms on how much, what percentage of your new township should be reserved for open spaces. 
the Karnataka government announced the relaxation of these norms, not for Bangalore, but for the rest of Karnataka. But you saw lots of protests, not in the rest of Karnataka, but in Bangalore. All environmentalist groups came together and they started protesting this, a relaxation of these norms. I assumed initially that the property developers would be rightly affected by this and would have to increase their prices and uh, take a lesser cut of uh, the margin would start agitating against this. They would uh, protest against this. They would pro protest in the media, not of course uh, dharna, but uh, through the media or something. They would say, say something about it. They would not support this. But later I found out that many high-end developers and upper middle class, developers for the upper middle class, they, they didn't give a shit about it. The reason, they had already priced it in. It didn't affect them. No such regulation affected them at all because they usually reserve more than 15 to 20 percent of their area for open spaces. Unlike up, uh, these developers, a lot of lower middle class and middle class developers and those developers developing houses for the poor couldn't afford to do those, do so. Uh, do so. so the bootleggers over here are these high-end developers who supported such measures, who supported these regulations. The Baptists are these, those media intellectuals and environmentalists who pontificated to us, who explained to us why even relax, why relaxing these norms would cause the environment to collapse and even more. Uh, two groups of people were affected by that. The first group of people are us consumers, especially the middle class and the lower middle class consumers who were forced to pay up higher, higher housing costs. The second group of people are the old, non-biggest, older, smaller developers as well as the newer developers, newer real estate developers. They had to face higher barriers in competing in the market. So this reduction in competition in the long term would again lead to higher housing costs. So now, in, now coming back to the transportation sector. So this map you see over here is the map of the Delhi urban agglomeration. So in the New Delhi urban agglomeration, you usually consider not only New Delhi, but cities and towns surrounding New Delhi. You see Gurugram over there, you see Meerut over there, you see Bulanshahar, Faridabad, Greater Noida. All this is a part of the giant urban agglomeration that is Delhi. In fact, it is the biggest in India. So at the southwest part of the map, you will see the place that we are in, near Rewadi. So from traveling from here to New Delhi, it takes me about two hours at the minimum, if I go through public transport. So one of the reasons I initially started about, uh, started studying about this issue was the trouble I faced in getting from that part of the map to the central part of the map. The reason I would go, I, I would go there every week. The reason I would go there every week, I am a South Indian living over here and I need my weekly fix of South Indian food. So that is available only in New Delhi. So I started studying up a little bit, digging around trying to find out why the public transport over here is so pathetic. I, came, I come from Bangalore and myself over there, it is not good but quite decent. So when I did that little digging around, I found out that in the entire district of Gurgaon, the State Road Transport Corporation has around 145 buses. Entire district of Gurgaon is more than 2 million people, more than 2 million perhaps. So the entire district of Gurgaon has 145 buses. Of these 145 buses, not more than 100 ply daily. Of these 100, many, many routes suffer from manpower shortages. So not even these 100 buses fly daily. This is the state that we are in. It is not the state only with Gurgaon or any place in NCR. If Unless you are in a good city like Bombay or in uh, Bangalore, you will suffer from something similar. Go ask your nearest tra road transport officer or the go to your nearest tra state road transport office and ask them how many buses fly in your city. The answer that they give will confirm to you that your city's transportation systems are pathetic. The reason for this, it, that graph over there shows state road transport corporations, fleet size and distance traveled. The fleet size as you, have, as you can see has already peaked and it peaked in 2009. We are rapidly growing, our urban areas are rapidly growing but the fleet size of the state road transport corporations have peaked already. See the losses of these state road transport corporations. And the interesting part is, this problem would have not been existent if the market was allowed to function. Initially I thought and I told many of my friends including Professor Javinder over here, 
uh, and my professors, other professors too, that the market would solve this problem. We don't need to worry. I thought six to seven months down the line, because a huge university has come, the market would come up and solve the problem. Some private player would put in a bus over here. Later, I found out the reason no private private player had put in that bus was the law prevented that person from doing so. Which law? A law passed in 1988, the Central Motor Vehicles Act. So certain provisions of this act allowed the state governments to nationalize their bus industries if they felt fit, if they felt, uh, felt it was needed. And most states felt it was needed. Why? They earned a lot of money from it at that point of time. And more than them earning the money from it, the politicians who ran these corporations earned even more. So what happened was, you uh, again came down to this alliance of bootleggers and Baptists. The bootleggers over here are the employee associations of these state road transport corporations as well as those fellows who illegally ply buses around now. The Baptists over here are these media intellectuals again and a few fellows in the transportation and consumer protection activists who rail against any attempts to reform the public transport industry because they think that uh, this would amount to Thatcherism or conservatism or anything, any term that they can turn up with. So you, as you can see, I had no data point to map profits. I only had to map losses over here. In more than 15, 20 years, the collective of SRTUs have never made a profit. The only state road transport corporation which has remained reasonably profitable is KSRTC in Karnataka and that too is turning out to be unprofitable now. So sometimes even amongst this alliance of boot, uh, Baptists and bootleggers, some of these Baptists, some politicians included, they might run illegal fleets on their side, uh, on the side. My Punjabi friends would know more about it. So is, can the problem be solved? In fact, uh, I can, I will be surprised to find out that it is already being solved. So the picture you see behind me is the Minister of Urban Development and Housing in the Union, Union Government. He is a Benkaya Naidu. So I am not saying he is doing much, but he is improving upon and in continuing the work done by his predecessor in the UPI government and pushing for many zonal reforms as well as construction reforms in urban areas across India through his various programs. This will have an effect on rental housing later on. And the other institution which is doing something in this regard is the Niti Ayo. Through its various reports, it is, its various model laws and the members uh, and the committee which the Niti Ayog members sit in, the committees, various government committees that Niti Ayog members sit in, they are pushing for taxi industry deregulation, bus deregulation and even more. The reason I find this issue to be quite important is because it affects the poorest amongst us the most. When I tell you about the alliance of Baptists and bootleggers in the bus industry and how it is harming, you must understand that those affected most by it are the poorest amongst us. The reason they are now faced with having to not even consider jobs, better paying jobs at dis the greater distances from their houses or their places where they live in because the public transportation system is not developed. They are also forced to pay higher alternative modes for, for higher prices for alternative modes of transport because many places the public transport industry is non-existent. Public transport is non-existent. So they'll have to go for an auto or a taxi or anything, anything else. They'll have to pay higher prices. So this, there is this very real reduction in the real incomes of the poorest amongst us because we don't, we don't find it important enough to reform our transportation industry as well as urban regulation. And that is why I think that I, I used to think that the pace of reform that was needed was much more than what it is now. But over the past few months, I've come grown to accept that this something is better than absolutely nothing. I hope I've convinced you of the same. Dhanyavad, Jai Shri Ram.